All right. Here we go. All right. Well, since we last spoke, obviously a lot's been transpiring in Israel and over the Middle East. And I know that some of us have probably tuned it out by now. Maybe you're just tired of it. Maybe it's just, you know, you're following it for a while. Maybe you stopped. Maybe you didn't follow it at all. But one way or the other, there's been a lot going on. And I thought that it would probably be appropriate to do something, a topic about some of these issues, because I have been involved in Jewish ministry for a number of years. I, um, you know, I've been involved. I was attending a Messianic congregation for years. I've been to Israel. I've definitely had a lot of experience in this area. I would say I don't claim to know everything, but I certainly have had a lot of um, time to think and ponder about these things. And I had to teach a class probably about seven years ago at our congregation on Zionism, <laughs> which uh, was kind of interesting. But, uh, you know, just a lot to talk about. So I don't expect everybody on this call to know all these issues. We're going to talk about Zionism. We're going to talk about the land. We're going to talk about anti-Semitism. Anti we're going to talk about spiritual warfare and talk about, you know, maybe even a couple other issues. We're going to try to, we're going to talk about a lot of different things. Um, but I definitely don't expect everybody to, uh, know everything about this. And I know everyone's at different areas. Maybe you have spent a lot of time looking into this. Maybe you haven't, maybe you have your own opinions about it. I don't know, but I'm not here to try to provoke, you know, um, division or anything. Cause I know people take different positions on some of these things, but I'm here to just put some stuff out here tonight and maybe get us to think about it. Okay. And talk about it. So. Okay. And obviously with CGF Ministries, that is a Jewish mission. So, you know, we care, obviously have a little more focus on this issue. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about Zionism. Um, if you haven't been around a long time, you may know that there's people protesting all across the country right now in different college campuses and elsewhere with signs saying Zionism is apartheid, calling Israel Zionist pigs, Zionist bad, Zion Zionism is evil. Um, so that word sometimes gets a really bad rap, okay? And there is a difference between um, Jewish, well, there, you have talked about Jewish Zionism and Christian Zionism, but Zionism is, you know, derived from the Bible because the word Zion is used um, 163 times in the Bible, right? 156 times in the Old Testament, seven times in the New Testament. So, um the land, actually, if you study biblical theology, most Old Testament theologians will tell you the land is one of the main talking points of the entire Old Testament. The land plays a central role, okay? And I understand that many of us, probably in Christianity, uh, do not know a whole lot or maybe care a lot about a piece of real estate over in the Middle East. We may think, ah, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven when I die. Jesus saved me. It's all that matters. Who cares, right? Well, biblically, it plays a big role in biblical theology, okay? But, of course, as time went on, you know, Zion or Zionism became a word, certainly, that was used among Jewish people for a desire for them to be a return to the land of Eretz Israel or Jerusalem. You know, it was a desire to go back, you know, and... uh of course, over the years, um, there's there's certainly a secular and political aspect of Zionism. And as we'll see, not all Jews agree on Zionism, what it is, and not all Christians agree on Zionism. So it certainly um, is a debating, debated hot talking point in, in many areas. Um, but as I said, the... Uh, it just became a modern Jewish term to express a desire for the Jewish people's return to Jerusalem and Israel. Okay. Um, it was for the term Zionism was first publicly used by a guy named Nathan Birnbaum at a discussion in Vienna and an evening of January 23rd, 1892. And then it was publicized in a work called the Jewish state four years later. And then you had the first, first Zionist Congress. Okay. And then as time went on, this gentleman here played a huge role because he, I'm sorry, he founded the Zionist movement in 1897 at the First World Zionist Congress in 
Basel, Switzerland, Basel, Switzerland. So, yes, it's true that, um, you know, there was certainly a secular and political, political aspect of Zionism. But today, you know, if um, if anyone's a Christian or anybody that thinks that the nation of Israel desire or should be able to continue to exist and the Jewish people should have a homeland to live in and Israel has a right to exist and fight for their existence at least, then technically you're endorsing some kind of Zionism. Whether you don't like the label or not, if you go up to a Palestinian or a, a Muslim who's hyper anti-Zionism and you tell them this is what you believe, they're going to think, they're gonna, oh, you're a Zionist. You know what I mean? And so, you know, it, you know, people like the labels, but the reality of it is that, um, you know, the question is, first of all, look at tonight, whether the Bible teaches anything about this, what it has to say, and then some other issues as well. Now, it's also true today that uh, there's certainly more Jews studying the Torah today in the state of Israel than ever before in Jewish history. There's more synagogues, yeshivas funded by the state than any in any country of the world. Uh, many, many Jews have moved back to Israel. They've, they've gone back to Israel, done Aliyah. They've gone up to Israel and they live there now. Of course, some Jews still live in different parts of the world, but there's more Jews living in the state of Israel than any time in history. Um, but for all the good things, there's also a lot of bad things there because like any other country, Israel um, has people in it. And as we know, people sin. All people sin, Jews, Gentiles, whatever your background is, we all sin, as the Bible says. So just like any other country, Israel is not a perfect country. They're not, um, you know, they're not sinless and blameless. I don't know anyone would think they, well, anyone would think they were, but uh, they have high problems with drug smuggling, trafficking of women, digital piracy. Um, and it is true that if you go to Israel, just in general, about to mention anywhere across the world with Jewish people, you know, there's a lot of Jewish people that don't believe in God. You know, they believe they're culturally Jewish or ethnically Jewish. They don't necessarily don't have a religious aspect to their Judaism. Right. And then there's some Jews that obviously are religious and ethnically Jewish, but they still practice some kind of Judaism and God plays a role in their lives. But there's certainly plenty of people, if you go to Israel, that are secular. You know, there is a certain secular aspect of Israel. So, you know, in believing that uh, Israel has a right to exist doesn't mean that, well, you know, they're not they're not like the Israel God called them to be. And they're not they're not holy and they're not living perfectly. They haven't accepted their Messiah. Therefore, we should just like get rid of them or something like that. Well, the Bible already talks about all that stuff. And that's not what the Bible teaches. So, um if God was to get rid of all the sin and if God was to penalize the church for all the sins of the church throughout the ages and all the sins of all the Christians, if he said, if you sin any more like that, I'm kicking you out, we'd all be in trouble. Okay. But he doesn't do that. Right. Um, so anyway, now within Judaism or, or Jews in general, there are a small portion of Orthodox Jews very, very, we, they sometimes are called fr on the fringes. Um, they reject any form of political Zionism, meaning that the establishment of Israel as a state, um, they think is not um, divine at all. It's got nothing to do with God, and they reject it because they think the restoration of Israel and Israel having its own independence and Israel being a healthy nation and Israel being what God wants them to be is obviously a work of God. And it has nothing to do with politics or secularism or any of that. So they they tend to reject any kind of modern state of Israel. Like I said, these people are very on the fringe. They don't they don't really represent a large majority of Jews, okay, but that is out there. And what they think also is that the one who actually makes Israel what it is and makes it a healthy looking nation and restores it, rest returns it to its prominence is the Messiah. And that's why a lot of them don't accept, of course, Jesus as a Messiah, because when they read the Old Testament, they see a lot of these texts in the Old Testament that talk about the Messianic rule. And a lot of these passages haven't been fulfilled yet. Um, there's a sitting there. And of course, you know, these things, we believe a lot of these things will happen at the second coming of Jesus for Christians that believe that. Some don't. 
But the point is that many of these Orthodox Jews think that Zionism is related to um, the coming of the Messiah. He's the one who restores Israel. It's not done through politics or anything man-made. It's all of a supernatural, comes from a supernatural starting place, okay? Now, notice that these passages right here is that uh, it looks like some sort of restoration of Israel, right, throughout the Old Testament. And you might have noticed that Peter says to Jesus in Acts 1, 6 to 8, after Jesus was about to ascend, before Jesus was just about to ascend to the Father, he, um, you know, Peter says to them, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus said to him, you're not permitted to know the times or periods that the Father is set by his own authority, but you see power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, been my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and the farthest parts of the earth. So, Peter is asking Jesus at that point, he's really asking them, he's saying, are you going to do this now? Are you really going to restore us to what the Old Testament talks about these passages, right? This is what Peter's thinking. And Jesus says, not now. He doesn't necessarily say no. He doesn't necessarily say yes, but he just says, this is not the time. It's not the time. Um, he says, you're not, this is not the times, you know, you to know. And you have other work to be doing. You need to start going to preach the gospel, right? And the missionary movement starts, okay? And Mamadides, who was one of the greatest Jewish thinkers in history, one of the most respected Jewish thinkers, um, wrote a lot of books, uh, kind of weaved in a lot of philosophy and theology together. Um, you know, he even thought the Messiah has to be the one to return first to bring all the Jews back out of exile into the land. OK, and so he believed the Messiah plays a huge role there as well. And I'm going to skip that, but let's talk a little. So that's like a little bit of Jewish Zionism. OK, and you're going to run into Jewish people um, like these sometimes, a very fringe group. You also run into Jewish secular people who may believe in some kind of Zionism, but don't re don't really appeal to any religious aspect of Zionism. And then you're going to have people that. Uh, who are Jewish that fully endorse Zionism, and then you're going to have some Jews that don't care, and then you're going to have some Jews that think it's bad. Um, it just depends, you know, which, which Jewish group you're talking to. But there's certainly plenty of Jews that do endorse some kind of Zionism. They think they need a homeland to live in, and Israel has a right to exist, okay? Now, let's talk a little bit about Christian Zionism. Now, Christian Zionism is something that um, has been around for a while, and that is the view that the Gentile believers in the church uh, believe that the Bible teaches some sort of Zionism. And most Christian Zionists are pretty supportive of the state of Israel. And they believe any return of the Jews to the land of Israel has something to do with fulfillment of prophecy. Okay. And many Christian, Zion Christian Zionists have been associated with a school of thought called dispensationalism. Now, if you go to Dallas Seminary or Moody Bible Institute in Chicago or MacArthur Seminary, John MacArthur Seminary, or I don't have the time to list all the seminaries, but there's some, of course, there's seminaries that teach dispensationalism and some don't. Some have the complete opposite view. But generally, dispensationalists were a group of Christians or theologians and Christians that always had a favorable view of Israel. They thought Israel played a, a, a large role in the Bible. They still believe in the future of Israel today. They still believe the land plays a role. They think the people play a role. They think there's a future for Israel. That's the way it's always been with dispensationalists. So most people that traditionally have not been fallen in any kind of replacement theology or what we call supersessionism are generally those people are non-dispensational of some kind. Now, when you study dispensationalism, there's always like a classical view and a progressive view. The classical dispensationalists are still around. And then you have what we call progressive dispensationalism. Those are guys like Daryl Bach at Dallas Seminary. Um, anyway, now, um, for any Christian Zionist that does support, uh, Israel is still on the plan of God. Like the land still plays a role and the people still play a role there. Um, that doesn't mean that they don't have any criticisms of Israel. 
Okay. It doesn't mean that they can't criticize it ever. It doesn't mean that, you know, they, the, the treatment of the Palestinians hasn't been, has been always perfect or something. They're not, you know, anyone that has a Zionist position or believes Israel has a role doesn't, doesn't just like, we, they're not like Israel worshipers, you know, at least the ones I know. Um, but some people perceive it as that way. Like they have to endorse everything Israel does or else it's wrong. Okay. But Israel can still be criticized. Okay. Somebody's not muted. I'm going to go back. And mute you. You're muted now. All right. Let's go back again. I'm going to just have to press mute all again. Okay. Let's go back here. Sorry, but that's what happens when someone's not muted. Okay. Now, um, so when it comes to um, anti-Zionist, anti-Zionist Christians, because there's a lot of anti-Zionist Christian apologists out there. Trust me, I've seen their books. Um, they're very critical of Christians who are Zionistic because they think, once again, it's associated with dispensationalism. And they don't like dispensationalism, so they just kind of weave them together and think that uh, all Christians who are Zionists are all dispensationalists. And they also think that Christian Zionists don't care about the Palestinians and we kind of just like worship Israel. Like, I think that's what we call straw man fallacy. I agree that if you do some research, there's some really weird Christian Zionists out there. There are some very strange ones, um, very fringe oriented Christian Zionists. But there is a case for scholarship which uh, can support a Zionist reading of the Bible. Um, and some of these anti-Christian Zionists might even say the Jewish people stole the land from the Arabs. Israel's occupation of West Bank violates international law. And the Zionism, Zionism is basically based on a secular view or political view. It's not religious. It's racist almost, okay? And there are those, those that espouse that view out there. Now, I had to teach from this book about six years ago. And uh, it was a newer book on Christian Zionism, a more scholarly updated view. And I, you know, this book, if you can get it, it'll help you understand a little more about Zionism. But uh, in this book, when these when these scholars in this book talk about the role of the land in the Bible, they they don't really get into focus on date setting with the end times, like some people have done in the past. Um, they they can talk about the land of Israel and the people of Israel central to the theme of the Bible, the storyline of the Bible, but they don't say that the state of Israel is perfect and it can't be criticized. Um, but they do believe that the state of Israel, of course, has a right to exist and it certainly is a protection place for two million non, for, include which includes obviously two million non-Jews as well. But it's what protects the people of Israel, of course, with God using that. And they argue that there was a Zionism long before dispensationalism. Let's, but dispensationalism started around the 1800s. But uh, they would argue that there were people that believed this long before dispensationalists. Okay. Um, now, there's been some really cool books that have come out to talk about the role of the land in the final events of, of the new heavens and the new earth when Jesus comes back um, and talks about the role of Israel in the Bible um, from a, when Jesus wanted to restore certain things, you know, was he dealing with the land at all? What did it have to do with the land? So that's talked about in the book for the nation right there. So there has been a lot of good work done on this topic. Um, so one thing you have to think about though, um, just a practical issue. So I was at the Mount of Olives last April I was actually right at that church at the bottom there where those buses are because you walk down, walk right down the stairs from the top and you you can, I was sitting waiting there in front of that church because um, all those buses go up to the, uh, I don't know if you can see my arrow, the Mount of Olives right here. These are all these tombs, these Jewish tombs all around here and you can go up to the very top here. But, you know, it's interesting that Jesus, you know, when he goes to ascend to the Father off the Mount of Olives, somewhere on the Mount of Olives, because it stretches further over. Um, it's interesting, the angel of the Lord in Acts 1 tells him that Jesus will come back in the same way he came, right? He left physically from this area, and he's coming back, you know, physically. 
And then we read in Zechariah 14 about how it says he will plant his feet on the Mount of Olives. The Lord will plant his feet on the Mount of Olives. So I guess my question is, if Israel has no role in the plan of God anymore, the land has no role. I guess my question is, where in the world does Jesus come back to? Does he come back to California? Does he come back to England? Does he come back to Russia? Does he return to um, China? I don't know where he's going to come to if he do, if there's no land there for him to come to. Okay, so Christians that have no see no role of the land anymore in the plan of God, I I like them to answer that question um, because that's a very interesting question. And when it comes to um, Israel's independence in 1948, of course, a lot of Christians say that this is a fulfillment of prophecy. Um, Christians are divided on this topic. Some Christians say, yes, it's definitely some sort of role, some sort of relation to a fulfillment of prophecy. And then others who don't believe Israel has a role in the plan of God say it happens strictly through political and pragmatic reasons, right? It just has nothing to do with God. It just happened mostly because of politics. And Christians debate this as well. Okay. Now, let me just skip ahead or I'll go back. But um, I'm sorry, I am going way too far ahead. All right, let me go back here. So what many Christians would say who don't believe any this had anything to do with prophecy, they would just say after World War II, when the land was um, partitioned and Israel got a land or got their state, um, they would say this strictly to happen because of the Holocaust and it happened for political reasons that they were given a homeland, a place to live, you know, stayed out of purely politics. OK, but they're not necessarily against it, but they certainly don't think God had anything to do with it. Then, of course, the other side is those that say, no, this is God's hand in the history of Israel and he's restored them to the land. Right. So there's two different views on that. Now, most people that don't see a role for Israel anymore dealing with the land, of course, this this falls into the thinking of what we call uh, supersessionism or replacement theology. And that's the idea of one person sitting on a chair displacing the latter. So um, sometimes people that don't like the title going by their, you know, being labeled as replacement theologians or being part of replacement theology or supersessionism, they'll call it fulfillment theology, but it's basically the same thing. Um, but this has been around throughout church history, and most people in Christianity have held to this view, um, don't see any future restoration of Israel. They think God ended Israel's role when Jesus came. Jesus swallowed up everything about Israel. Everything was fulfilled in him. Um, Israel is more of like a type in the Jewish scriptures of the Old Testament, which leads to the anti-type, the church. That's what typology is. So the church or the ecclesia is the new Israel. And the land, of course, has no purpose in the plan of God. So all those land promises, as we'll talk about in the Abrahamic covenant, have been universalized to include the entire world. So, um, and they also think that when the Jews uh, rejected Jesus, that God judged Israel at the destruction of the temple in 70, 70 AD. So he just like, he's done with Israel. So that's just some of the tenets of supersessionism, replacement theology, but that's certainly been throughout church history. There's a few good books if you want to go deeper on this and really get a deeper view. Um, all these, uh, you know, the issues, the details of this in these books right here, if you want to go deeper. But I do think it's worth reading because if you want to know how to look at the Bible, it does impact how you read the Bible, no doubt about it. So what a common narrative is that, um, like I said, is that uh, among non-Christian Zionists, Christ, you know, Christians that are against Christian Zionism, they might say, you know, they'll say the Jewish people stole the land from the Arabs and Arabs uh, occupation of the West Bank or the Gaza, you know, strip or, you know, violates international law. Zionism is basically secular um, and conservative Christian support for Israel is a blind eye. It's kind of like a, they turn a blind a blind eye to the injustices of the Palestinians. So they think it's too one-sided. Um, that's their common complaint. 
the Christians are blinded by the love for Israel and supporting Israel and all that stuff that they don't care about anything with the Palestinians. Okay. And maybe that has been true in some cases. I'm not saying it hasn't. I don't know every Christian out there and what they believe, but I'm sure that's possible. Now, let me talk a little about the Abrahamic covenant in the Bible. Um, you know, there's several covenants, but this is an extremely important one because this is one of the earliest covenants. And obviously the first part of the Abrahamic covenant is God and the other party parties are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their biological descendants, which are the Jewish people. Now you're going to read about this covenant, certainly starting in Genesis 12, you're going to see it repeated many times in Genesis, right? And it was this covenant was established with Isaac and his descendants, not with Ishmael or Ishmael's descendants, right? For all of you to study the Old Testament. So God designated Isaac and his descendants to, of course, be the parties of the Abrahamic covenant. And while he refused um, to include Ishmael and the Arab people in there, he did, however, promise to bless Ishmael and his descendants. And you may say, well, how's he done that? Well, if you look at number two here, um, Arab zone and occupy more than 99.9% .9 of the land across Northern Africa and the Middle East. By contrast, the state of Israel owns and occupies less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of the land area. In addition, Arab people possess some of the largest oil reserves in the world, give them access to great wealth, international influence. So if you want to talk about from a land perspective and a monetary perspective that, you know, they've done pretty well in that area. Yes, there's problems, of course. Um, doesn't mean there's, you know, obviously the belief system, believing in Islam is not what God wants. He wants them to come to faith in the one true God and come to faith in Jesus. But the point is that uh, God has certainly carried out that that blessing from a, from that perspective. Now, so if you look today at this map, you can see that in the Middle East, that Israel is the land Israel has right now is about the size of New Jersey. Um, if you actually do the demographics on it, geography as well, it's certainly a tiny, tiny little piece over here and surrounded by all these other countries, the Arab countries, right? And that is, as you know, that's a blemish on their their area there. They want all of that to be Arab, right? So here you have this tiny little land piece here, uh, size of New Jersey. Genesis 1518 determined the boundaries of the land grant from God to Abraham's descendants, right? And the land grant in Genesis 1518 calls for a stretch of land of 300,000 square miles or 12 and one and a half times the size of Great Britain and Ireland. And of course, the Jews have never attained these boundaries, right? They never have. Now, when you think of... Um, you know, when you talk about the Abraham covenant, of course, you know, Canaan was the name of the land at the time of Abraham, right? I mean, they were called, there's the pagan peoples that are called the Canaanites. You guys remember that in the Old Testament. And its boundaries were east of the Mediterranean Sea, south of modern day Lebanon and Syria, and the west of the modern day Jordan with the Jordan River as the border, right? And then we read, of course, as God told them to do, to go in to um, drive the Canaanites out, which they didn't do perfectly. Joshua, of course, conquered the promised land and Canaan was renamed Israel. And the new name of Israel, of course, was already given to Jacob earlier in Genesis 32, 28. And so the people living in Israel called Israelites to the children of Israel. Um, so, you know, there are aspects of the Abrahamic covenant that have been partially fulfilled. Certainly God gave Abraham and made him a father of multitude of nations, right? And Israel is descended from him through Isaac and Jacob. Of course, um, Israel's never perished as a people, despite all the persecutions, all the scattering around the world, all the, the diaspora, living in diaspora, living outside Israel, all the, the persecutions, they're still existing. There's still 15 million Jewish people on this planet. I think that's the number, it's 15 million. Um, I may have to recheck that, but it's something like that. And of course, universally, the Abrahamic covenant is supposed to be universal blessing to the whole world, right? Because God tells Abraham, through your seed, the nations will be blessed. And we know that through the seed of Abraham, the Messiah comes 
and he opens the door to all the nations to believe. There's no other Jewish person in the history of Judaism that has helped 1.4 million non-Jews come to faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? That's prophetic, and that has come to pass statistically and empirically, okay? So God has fulfilled, kept his promise on allowing the seed of Abraham to bless the whole world, right? Now, when it comes to Abraham and covenant, Remember, some covenants are conditional and unconditional, or else they have aspects of both inside the covenant. Um, it is true that God told Israel um, that, you know, the enjoyment and habitation of the land is contingent on their faithfulness, meaning that when God gave Israel the Torah or the law, that gave the stipulations on what would happen if they don't carry out the covenant, you know, if they don't live out the stipulations of the covenant. And we know that God warned them about if they disobeyed, they'd be exiled out of the land, right? That's what God said. Of course, that happened, right? But you don't want to confuse the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant or the, the covenant and the Torah, okay? There's two different things going on here. They're related, but most people get these confused, okay? Because the Abrahamic covenant, um, the nature of it is unconditional, that means God made a promise, and he will keep that promise no matter what Israel does. Now, Israel right now does not benefit completely from that covenant because they have not um, lived out, the. they didn't end up living out the stipulations from the Mosaic covenant, how that impacted the Abrahamic covenant. That means that they disobeyed and they were exiled all over in different parts of the world. That's why there's been several exiles, and they're still not all living in the land, right? But God doesn't say the covenant is suddenly just scratched out, okay? Um, an unconditional covenant means it's based on the faithfulness and oath of God, okay? It's not dependent on their obedience or faith, okay? Um, yes, the blessings are, are, they're not going to experience the blessings of the covenant if they disobey, but the unconditional oath and faithfulness of God remains. So, what God does, if you read throughout the Old Testament, is even though they broke the covenant and they were scattered and exiled, we know there's plenty of passages that uh, God promises to return the Jewish people to the land of Israel and their unbelief. Um, and some people may say, well, you know, the, the Israel, Israel attained all the land under Joshua or King Solomon's rule to try to give arguments. It was all possessed under Josh and King Solomon. Um, if that's the case, then all the prophets still spoke about a future for the land of Israel in relation to the land. So whatever they gained under Josh or Solomon was lost again. Okay. And all the prophets looked to another regathering or another return to the land. Okay. Um, so there's always this future hope of a, of an, of a return. Okay. Now, of course, according to Genesis 15, 18, Joshua 1, 4, the land God gave to Israel included everything from the Nile River in Egypt, if you look at this map, to Lebanon, south to north, and everything from the Mediterranean Sea, the Euphrates River, west to east. Okay? So if you look at that map, see the little red diagram that goes around here? Not, not where Israel is, not that triangle. These are the geographical boundaries that God promised Israel, all that land right there. I think you probably know that if you look at that map, that Israel does not have hardly any of that land, right? They have this tiny little sliver the size of New Jersey, right? And the land God um, that stated belonged to Israel in the original Abrahamic covenant um, includes everything modern day Israel possesses, that little sliver, but it also includes that the whole land promise is now part of um has some of egypt syria there of course jordan some of saudi arabia and iraq and of course the west bank and gaza so israel being a state by themselves is just a little small small tiny piece there and what they originally promised right and of course we'll talk a little bit about how they tried to um work to even exist even as that tiny little piece of real estate the size of new jersey okay so israel only possesses a fraction of what the land was promised, that God promised in um, the Abrahamic covenant. So 
there is that passage in Genesis 17 that says, and I'll give you to you and to your offspring after the land of the sojourners, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, I will be their God. Remember, God wanted the land to be a place he would dwell with the people. Okay, it's about God having sacred space with his people. Okay, God cares about sacred space. It's not just a piece of real estate that has no real meaning in the in the heart of God. It's very important, right? And so he says here, there's a phrase from everlasting to everlasting. It's called min olam vayet olam. And that is the strongest expression in Hebrew described perpetual being something perpetual and eternal, okay? And there's only two exceptional usages in which this phrase does not refer to God. In both cases, it refers to the nation of Israel's eternal possession. You will read it in Jeremiah 7.7. 7. It says, I'll let you dwell in this place and the land I gave to your fathers forever and ever. And in Jeremiah 25.5, it says, Israel will dwell on the land the Lord has given you and your fathers forever and ever. That phrase now, it's true. If you look at the Old Testament, the way, the way alam is used, if you look up you know, Hebrew for alam in different places, sometimes it's only for a long period of time. Sometimes it's for a certain select period of time. It's not always means eternal forever and ever the way we see it as unending. Um, but in this case, if you compare it to Jeremiah 7, 7, Jeremiah 25, 5, um, it's very similar to something that refers to something that is eternal. You know, it's not just a short-term period. So that's something you think we need to think about. Remember, God says in Psalm 105, 8 to 11, he says, he always remember his covenantal decree, the promise he made to a thousand generations, the promise he made to Abraham, the promise he made by oath to Isaac. He gave it to Jacob as a decree, to Israel's a lasting promise saying to you, I will give the land of Canaan as the portion of your inheritance. And then he says in Psalm 32, 13 to 14, he says, certainly the Lord has chosen Zion. He decided to make it his home. He said, this will be my resting place forever. I'll live there for I've chosen. Okay. So there are a lot of positive statements about the land, the Psalms as well. Now, what about the New Testament? Well, it's true that Jesus didn't have to give a teaching about the importance of the land. Um, he, talk, he talks about blessed are those uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, they will, He talks about that passage, but blessed are those. Um, that passage says that they will inherit the earth. Um, you know, I'm talking about Matthew 5. But that can be translated as land. There is Eretz, Eretz their land. That's, you know, that can, that's translated as land, too. They will inherit the land. Um, but anyway, the point is, though, that the Jews at the time of Jesus were not in exile. Yes, they're living under Roman rule. And they had had to deal with all that, but they're not exiled necessarily out of the land, right? They're living in the land, okay? So they didn't necessarily have to give a history lesson about restoration of the land at the time. Of course, those passages are already there in the Old Testament, which they had read as Jews. You know, Paul says in Romans 9, 1 to 5, that, you know, he says that he wishes he was cut off from the Messiah so that his brethren, his kinsmen, according to flesh, the Jews— would come to know the Messiah. Remember, he was an incredibly, I mean, you know, he was a new believer. I mean, he was, you know, one of the first people that took the gospel out to the Jew first, along with the other apostles. We know who Paul was, but he's so burdened for his people, he says, I'd rather be cut off or cursed on the side so they come to know him. And then he goes on to describe in Romans 9, he talks about the nine blessings in point three here today. He says, in the present tense, they are Israelites, and he says, they still have the covenants, the temple service, and the promises still belong to them. Now, he doesn't say they're one covenant. He talks about covenants in the plural. The covenants still belong to them, okay? This is what Paul says, in the present tense, okay? So, to say that uh, that the land covenant wouldn't be part of that covenant is kind of Interesting if you would make that argument, or any of the covenants are still, you know, saying the covenants have no relevance anymore. But the point is that Israel still has, um, in the present tense, these things still belong to them, as Paul is saying. And then he goes on to say in Romans 11, 28 to 29, that 
while the people of Israel are enemies of the gospel at the time, meaning they're in rejection. You know, they're rejecting their Messiah mostly. Yes, there's Jews that believe today, but there's a lot of Jews who don't believe. They're in a state of rejection. Um, but he goes on to say, even though they're in a state of rejection, they're beloved for the sake of the fathers. And he says, the gifts and callings of God cannot be revoked. Okay, that means something that one does not take back. Okay, so if you're saying that God has no plan for Israel and the land anymore, then you're going to have to wrestle with Paul's statements in Romans 9 through 11. Okay, um, it just, it, you got to do some serious hermeneutical gymnastics, as I like to put it. Okay, now, um, also if you read, the end of Romans 11, when Paul talks about all Israel will be saved, he talks about, you know, then all Israel will be saved after the fulfillment or the fullness of the Gentiles, etc. Um, he quotes Romans 11, 27 as support for the salvation of national Israel. Look what he says here. He says, this is my covenant. This will be my covenant. Then I take away their sins. He's going back to Jeremiah 31. But then when he says, in Romans eleven twenty six 26, in point four here, he says, someday all Israel will be saved. He said that Israel's deliverer will come from Zion, and he banished all ungodliness from Jacob. So he talks about this deliverer, which is the Messiah, right, coming from Zion, right? Okay, so Paul seems to see something there in the future that relate to someone, you know, the, the importance of Zion there, okay? So... You might notice in Matthew 23, 37 to 39, when Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and the stones. These are the children together as hen gathers her brood under her wings that you were not willing. See, your house has left you desolate, for I tell you not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So notice he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he says, You won't see me again until. So until you welcome, so Israel, he's saying Israel, he will not come back to Jerusalem until they welcome him, until they're ready to receive him, right? He says, you won't see me again until you say, there's a conditional thing here, until you say, um, or unless, okay? So if there's no purpose for Jerusalem in the future, then I don't know what Jesus is talking about there, okay? And then in Acts 13, 19, um, Jesus, Paul goes on to say when he's recounting the Exodus there, he's giving that little sermon in Acts 13. He says, after destroying seven nations, the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. Um, Paul says, you know, he talks about the inheritance they were given. So he's aware of the Abrahamic covenant. Okay, it's still important to Paul at that point. Okay. And then... Uh, in the book of Revelation, we know that Lamb will not stand on earth in general, but on Mount Zion, right? And the new earth that is to come will be centered in Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem will have the 12 gates inscribed with the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. Now, we think of the new heavens and the new earth, which is way out there, I know you guys can't or just have a hard time thinking that far ahead. We need to realize that when we say that we're not saying that God destroys the earth, he annihilates it. Okay, there's going to be what we would say a re renewed earth, it's going to be definitely different and changed, but it's still going to have some continuity with the old earth. Okay, just like your resurrection body you have one day, there's still continuity with you, you're still you. All right. God doesn't just like get rid of you. You're still there. He gives you a resurrection body. There's still continuity with you. I mean, it's right. And, you know, I don't know exactly what the body's going to look like. I mean, it'll definitely probably be a body without sickness and it will be dominated by the Holy Spirit, as Paul talks about Romans, or I'm sorry, First Corinthians 15. But uh, the earth, the renewed earth is, um, there's nothing that teaches that it's not going to have like places like you know like a like a nations okay i don't you know but the point is israel would have to be part of that okay 
so like I said, for those Christians who do not believe the Abrahamic covenant has any relevance today, um, they would say that Zionism, as I said before, as I say, number one here, they would say Zionism was instead a reaction of the Jewish people to worldwide persecution during World Wars I and II. No nation would take them in, of course, and so they were kind of forced to create their own nation, and it just really had more to do with politics, okay? But as I said, they don't think it has anything to do with prophecy, okay? Now, I would say number three here, very very clearly, number three, any Christian who would say the Jews deserve no homeland at all, I would say that could be labeled a form of being anti-Semitic, okay? I'll go far as to say that on the record, okay? Um, if you think the Jews should just be scattered across the nations and they should have no place to go to, no land at all, then you're basically saying every other people group deserves a homeland. They all have one, Swiss, German, you know, most, as you know, China, whatever, but you're saying the Jews deserve no homeland at all. Just ask yourself, why do you believe that? Okay, what is your argument? What is your argument for that? I'll give you an example. This is an example of um, a group of uh, people that don't think the land that is the Jewish people, the, the land of Israel has no role anymore, basically. This was a letter a ways back um, from a bunch of replacement theologians. Um, this is what they say here. An open letter to evangelicals and other minister parties from Knox Theological Seminary. The people of God, the land of Israel, and partiality of the gospel. It says the entitlement of any one ethnic or religious group to territory in the Middle East called the Holy Land cannot be supported by Scripture. In fact, the land promises specific to Israel in the Old Testament are filled by Joshua. That is incorrect, as I just said. There was, even after Joshua, they were exiled again, and there was all kinds of things written about the prophets about a future restoration. Then it says, the New Testament speaks clearly and prophetically about destruction in the Second Temple in A.D. 70. No New Testament writer foresees a regathering of ethnic Israel in the land, as I just said, that's because they're already living in the land, as did the prophets of the Old Testament after the destruction of the First Temple in 586 B.C. Moreover, the land promises of the Old Testament are consistently duly expanded, and the New Testament show the universal dominion of Jesus who reigns from heaven upon the throne of David, inviting all the nations of the gospel, grace for take his universal and everlasting dominion. So, see, what they do is they take Jesus, everything that Israel was was uh, called to be in their particularism, a particular land, a particular people. They universalize everything that Jesus has universalized all that. And because he's universalized everything, it gets rid of the particular, it gets rid of the land, it gets rid of all that stuff. So I would agree that Jesus certainly universalizes um, all people. There's, God shows no partiality. All people are, come to faith in Jesus. We're all on the same page. We're all have the same identity. We're all one in him. Um, but to say that he, that uh, Jesus completely or the New Testament authors completely end the purpose of the land completely is is can be challenged. OK, there's some passages that really could challenge that. OK. All right. So let's switch gears and talk about Palestine. I know you guys are just waiting for this. Um, you know, some would say it's inappropriate to call Israel Palestine. Um, because, of course, the Bible never calls a land by this name, nor is there any sovereign state today by that name. The ancient biblical contemporary political name is Israel. Um, some Palestinians make this claim to the land by identifying themselves as descendants of the ancient Canaanites. So the Canaanites that Joshua drove out, right, in the Old Testament, that God commanded Israel, Israel to drive out, they think they're descendants of the ancient Canaanites. But that's really hard to prove. Uh, most Palestinian Arabs are a mixed group that immigrated the land a long time after the biblical period. Now, the word Palestine has been debated for years. Um, we're still not sure exactly, you know, there's there's some debate over the name, of course, but um, generally it's derived from where we get the, um, it's referring to the the, uh, the area described the inhabitants of the land of the northeast of Egypt, the Philistines, or the Philistines were. Of course, the Philistines were more closely related to the Greeks, right, with no connection ethnically, linguistically, historically to Arabia. Remember, um, well, anyway, I'll talk more about this. So 
you know, some people refer that's that's you know Philistia right there, right? This narrow strip of land on the Mediterranean Sea, the land of Philistines. You remember Goliath, right? Goliath fighting David. He was the Philistine, right? They were the enemies of God's people. Okay. Um, so that's what some people refer to when they say when they're referring to Palestine, where that comes from. Um it is true that uh some people refer to there are some people like Aristotle, Herodotus, and Plutarch that referred the land of Israel called they referred to the land called Palestine um in the, you know as early as the fifth century. Um, but like I said, many scholars think the word Palestine means land of the Philistines, which which the region include the place the Philistines lived in Canaan. But you know, it's still debated a bit. Now, the first time we have Judea uh, you know, changed to be called Palestine is really about a period called 132 to 135 AD, because what happened was, this is on after Jesus, there was another Messianic figure that arose. He was a military leader, a Jewish military leader named Bar Kokhba, and basically he read another revolt against the Romans. Remember the Jews always revolted against the Romans constantly and they got slaughtered? Well, he tried to lead another revolt, and a guy named Rabbi Kiva at the time anointed him or said, he's a messiah, he's a messiah, and they followed him into another bloody death. They got squashed by the Romans. They both got killed, and the Roman emperor Hadrian completely squashed that movement, okay? So what he did after he squashed that movement, he expelled the Jews from Jerusalem, Um and decreed the city and surrounded territory be part of a large entity known as Syria, Palestina. And so Palestina took its name from the ancient Philistines, right, which are the em enemies of Israel. And so what uh, Hadrian did, he kind of just rubbed that in their face after their defeat. He wanted to rid the land of anything Jewish, and he basically changed the name, and then he, you know, it was, it was called Palestine following the lead of the Romans, okay, the lead of the Romans. Of course, there's nowhere in the New Testament that, you know, Palestine is mentioned, Jesus, says Jesus, you know, it, there's nowhere, as you know, when you read the, the Bible, especially New Testament, Palestine is mentioned, okay? But that's the first time it's really enters into the lexicon of, um, you know, from there on out, it's still in our lexicon today. Now, I'll go ahead and skip that. Okay. Now, some called Israel Palestine, of course, is a description of the landmass of Israel prior to 1948. Of course, Yasser Arafat, which embezzled $900 million um, into a Swiss bank account, by the way. Remember, the U.S. gave the Palestinian, the PLO, millions and millions of dollars, and he embezzled it. Um, he took the definition for Palestine, went from geographical to political, and so he started to describe the displaced people called the Palestinians who needed an ancestral homeland. And of course, there's Arabs in neighboring countries that never call themselves Palestinians, rather Syrians, Lebanese, Jordanians, Egyptians, etc. So not all Arabs call themselves Palestinians, as we know. Um, and the main difference between Israel and Palestine is that Israel is a nation, Palestine is a geographical region. Um, Palestine is not clearly a nation, of course they want to be. And the nation of Israel should be distinguished from the land region of Palestine. Of course, before the kingdom of Israel existed, in the region was called Canaan. And of course, the region delineated, delineated as Canaan or later Palestine is not necessarily the same as the boundaries for Israel described in the Bible. Now, I just want to mention this. I know I've, I'm going a long time. I just, there's a lot to cover here. I just have a little more. Um, let me talk about seven times the Palestinians rejected peace, okay? And I'll, I just want you to know, I do have something to say about this. I'm not trying to completely make this one-sided. I know it comes across as one-sided, but I'm trying to be as fair as I can, okay? I'm, that's really my intent. Um, there was a first uh, attempt to uh, a peace deal back in 1917 with the Belfar Declaration, declared a Jewish homeland, but also mandated that nothing be done to exist any Arab communities. Um, but then there was a riot in April 1920 when Jerusalem, Palestinians, and nearby towns poured in and started jihad against, jihad against the Jews. 
Um, so that didn't work. And then there was a second one in 1937 when there was a um, leadership under a guy named Com Wiseman, and he proposed a two-state solution. And the Jews offered up a smaller territory in the coast from Tel Aviv up through the north, making about one-fifth the remaining mandate territory. The Palestinians, for their own state, would take the remaining four-fifths, and they did not accept it. They wanted the whole thing and rejected it. So that, you know, they that didn't work either. And then in May 1948, the UN recommended still another partition to the General Assembly. Um, it would divide the territory almost equally. The Zionists and Goodwill made their acceptance known immediately. They said, that's fine. Palestinians said no. Um, and they said any partition plan would be met with rivers of blood. And of course, you had the Arab Liberation Army that was sent to annihilate the Jews. The Jews won that victory, but the Palestinians ended up with nothing, ended up becoming refugees. And that's a big debate to this day that many of the refugees that left them, they, the Palestinians complained that they were kicked out. Um, Jews will say, no, we didn't kick you out. You left willingly. Um, your other leaders from other countries told you to leave Israel. We didn't boot you. That's an ongoing debate. And that's one of the reasons the Palestinians are so bitter against the Jews. They think that they kicked them out there and all they became refugees. But that's a certainly a debated point that goes on and on. And Palestinians have their narrative and, you know, Jews have their narrative. But, um, you know, we can debate. That's a big, long debate. Then in 1933 in Oslo, the Palestinians could have gotten everything they wanted, complete mutual letters of recognition, their own state. Arafat rejected it, as usual. Um, you know, Yasser Arafat, if you remember him, leader of the PLO movement. Then in 2000 at Camp David, Barack agreed to borders proposed by Bill Clinton. Clinton, Bart, you know, he made a deal worked on a peace treaty, the agreement would establish a West Bank, Gaza, Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as the Palestinian capital. That's a huge opportunity. But Arafat rejected it again, started a second war against the Jews or second, you know, phase of killing against the Jews or terrorist, terrorism against the Jews. Then in 2005, Sharon, uh, the leader of Israel then, the prime minister decided it was neither economically or nor militarily feasible for Israel to govern 1.1 million Palestinians in Gaza. So he dismantled all the settlements there and recalled the Israel army back to the 1967 border between Israel and Gaza without land swaps, so at the same time leaving behind donated greenhouses, which the people there could have used to create an agriculture uh, export industry to jumpstart their failing economy. Palestinians destroyed the greenhouses and proceeded to launch an inter, um, another attack of rockets against civilian targets in Israel. Then in September 2008, um, there was another uh, deal on the table with um, President Palestinian President Abbas, Abbas um, with another partition plan. It was a detailed map of a future Palestinian state which would have been mutually agreed land swaps. Palestinians would have gotten all the West Bank and Gaza prior to the 67 war. And they also said they would divide Jerusalem or a proposal to even divide Jerusalem, which is like, you know, that's a huge deal. But Abbas, Abbas did not uh, ever accept it, went back to his office and never really accepted the plan. OK, now um, there is a saying going around Israel's an apartheid state. It's ridiculous. Um, even the leader of or the, um, this gentleman that went through apartheid in South Africa. Um, he, I think he was there when Mendel was there. Um, he does not see that as being true at all. Someone that lived under apartheid. He said that is just nonsense. Um, you know, when in 1947, Israel's first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion, said he wanted all Arab citizens to feel safe at home in Israel. He said, if the Arab citizen will feel at home in our state, if the state will help them in a truthful and dedicated way to reach the economic, social, and cultural of the Jewish community, then Arab distrust will accordingly subside and bridge will be built to Semitic Jewish Arab alliance. Um, Israel protects the political rights of its minorities, which is unique in the Middle East. They guarantee its non Jewish citizens all rights and privilege of Israeli citizenship. So when you're an Arab living in Israel, you have equal rights. You can vote. You can serve in the Knesset. Um, you're given a right to vote and to be elected. Um, 
you're given complete participation in Israel society. Um, you can be active in Israeli civil uh, or societal, social, political, and civic life and enjoy representation in the Knesset Foreign Service and Judicial System. That doesn't sound like an apartheid state to me. Um, similar view is that Israel is part of colonization. Look at there's signs from last week. Look at the sign right there. Zionism is as white settlement colonization. So many anti-Israel activists and academics use the term settler colonism to describe the political colonialism. I'm sorry. Colonialism described the political and demographic changes over the last 50 years and what today is the state of Israel in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. They argue the Jews were only a small minority of the population in the late 19th century in what was called the then Ottoman Empire and that the European Jews subsequently colonized and seized Palestinian land and resources. So remember that um, the original Jewish settlers in the late 19th and early 20th centuries weren't sent by another country to go over to set up enclaves for honor and profit, right? They were escaping countries that didn't want them. They were escaping anti-Semitic some anti-Semitic issues, a lot of anti-Semitic issues. You know, as we know, number three, you know, if the French in Algeria could return to France and the British in India could return to the England. But many Jews in Israel, including many who fled persecution, had no other money, mother country which they could return. So Jews are native and indigenous to the land. The Europeans who settled in colonies in the Middle East and North Africa were not in, in um, native to land in any way. So the Zionist movement was never to subjugate the existing population, steal their resources and land holdings. That was never part of the Zionist movement, contrary to the narrative that's being fed out there. Um, to say that Israel is like imperialistic, um, you know, yeah, Zionism does have a liberation aspect to it because they're saying, you know, they are entitled to homeland. But, you know, if Zionism is imperialistic and seeks to conquer Arab ter territory. Why, if that's the case, that Israel, you know, wants to be imperialistic and dominate all Arab, Arab you know, Arabs and Arab territory and treat them as second class citizens, why is Israel so many times returned land to them and gone for a two state solution? They returned the Sinai Peninsula, Peninsula to Egypt in exchange for peace in 1979. They offered the return of the Golan Heights to Syria in exchange for a peace agreement. And, you know, why have they offered all of Gaza 90% of the West Bank to the Palestinians if they're so interested in being imperialistic, okay, and doing colonization? It just doesn't add up. Now, I'm well aware that you cannot get through the Palestinian media they, they will not listen to you. They have a narrative that's been ongoing for decades and they will not listen to any of this. They completely reject it. They won't hear one bit of it. Okay, and I'll tell you a story I had a, today of that happening. Um, I'm going to have to skip ahead here. We're running out of time. Um, okay. Okay, let's ask a question. If you agree that God has eternally promised to give... Canaan to Israel, the land, that land to Israel that he did through the Abraham Covenant, what, you may ask, what political policy should believers support? Okay. Uh, the question is pertinent given that the modern state of Israel is not only a secular institution, but also one that is times restricted Christian evangels and I citizen to Messianic Jews. But, you know, as we know, uh, there are a lot of believers in Israel. There's a huge, there's a larger Messianic Jewish community than there used to be, which is something else that has happened since the establishment of the uh, the state after 1948, that the Messianic Jews have grown there. There is a large Jewish believing Jesus population. I mean, large meaning like 6,000, but still that was used to be like nothing. Um, and that leads me to finish up with anti-Semitism really quickly. Um, we'll go a little longer tonight if you can hang in there. I don't care. There's different forms of anti-Semitism. Um, Anti-Semitism can be used, can be based on hatred or discrimination against the Jewish people because of their religious beliefs or ethnicity. Um, some forms of anti-Zionism anti can be a form of anti-Semitism, meaning that if you don't think Jews have a right to a homeland, at least, I'm not saying you can't criticize Israel ever, but certainly to say the Jews deserve no homeland of all could be perceived as a, as a form of anti-Semitism. And also there's theological anti-Semitism, you know, where it's just the critical rejection of Jewish principles and beliefs. 
different reasons for anti-Semitism. Um, there's, of course, a racial theory that Jews are hated because they're an inferior race. That's what Hitler thought. There's an economic theory that Jews are hated because they possess too much wealth and power. I've heard that one throughout the years. The Jews control everything. The outsider's theory that Jews are hated because they're different from everyone else. It's called the scapegoat theory. The Jews are hated because they're the cause of all the world's problems. The Jews get blamed for just a lot of stuff. Um, or there's the decide theory. The Jews are just hated because Christians still believe they're the ones who killed Jesus, even though Jesus said that I'm going to lay down my life willingly and he had to die for your sins and my sins. I sure am glad he did that. But for some reason, the Jews are still to blame. I wonder what would have happened if he hadn't died. Um, then there's the Chosen people theory, the Jews are hated because they declare to be the chosen ones of God, the elected people of God, right? And some Jews certainly do believe that, but there's some Jews that obviously know that the election of their people was due to the grace of God. There was nothing special about them. Um, and I do believe throughout history, there has been a sense of Gentile inferiority, that Gentile Christians do feel not everybody but they do feel sense of inferiority at times i dealt with that in my own christian circles just interacting different christians i don't know why that is you have jesus your identity is in him he gives you everything you're complete in him but some people still have that problem uh it is true that arab people are semitic as well right the ancient babylons and assyrians were semitic um obviously people could be anti Arab and anti that, and, and they're anti that kind of Semitic people. But when we speak of being anti Semitic, we don't mean anti Arab, and we certainly don't mean anti Babylon or anti Syrian, obviously. Now, as I said, it is true that there's honest criticism of Jewish individuals or groups and anti Semitism, just as there is a world of difference between, say, fair and honest criticism of African and American individuals or groups or racism against African Americans, right? So um, you know, if you criticize, like I have Jewish friends or I know Jewish people in Israel, there are Jewish people, they're secular as can be, they're immoral, they don't hold to my ethics. Um, you know, Hollywood's filled with all kinds of Jewish people there that have made all kinds of movies and things that are ungodly. We know that. So, you know, we can criticize that and say that's not godly, it's not what God wants, and these people are off track and all that. That's not an being anti Semitic. Okay. Um, so I just want to make that clear. It's not um, anti-Semitic to state that some of the historic and suffering of the Jewish people is a result of divine judgment. Because we know when you read the Old Testament that Israel suffered um, from God's judgment because they did not keep the covenant, the Mosaic law, which gave the stipulations of the land covenant, they were exiled, right? So they suffer for that from their own disobedience, right? And we know that after the destruction of the temple, after the one Jesus was in the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, there was an exile again. And that's the consequence, you know, of, uh, once again, of sin. So that we can say those things without being anti-Semitic. Um, but we know that anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism has been around for a long time. Started, we see it in uh, Exodus 1. When Egypt wanted to destroy the Jews, when Pharaoh gave the order to murder the Jewish baby boys. We know we see it in ancient Persia, which is modern Iran, wanted to eradicate the Jews through the wicked plot of Haman in the book of Esther. We know in the ancient empires of Babylonia, Greece, and Rome, Jews who originated in the ancient kingdom of Judea were often criticized and persecuted for their efforts to remain a separate culture group rather than taking on the religious and social customs of their conquerors, and we know the we had the Russian pogroms, which were awful for Jews and um, Jews in other countries. You know, is certainly um, were you know just encouraged. You know, these pogroms are encouraged to persecute Jewish people. They're aided by government political uh, police forces, and then of course. Uh, we have Nazi, uh, the Nazis and what they did, of course. So that we, we all know about that anti-Semitism. A lot of books have been written also about Christian anti-Semitism. The church has a long history of anti-Semitism. It's ugly. If you never studied it, it can be quite sobering. I encourage you to do it. You may end up not being very encouraged, but it has to be talked about. Um, a lot of history there uh, of anti-Semitism involving the church. 
okay, and the way they've treated the Jewish people. Now, you could say that's not really the church. These are fake Christians. I don't know whether they're saved or unsaved. Martin Luther said a lot of anti-Semitic things, anti-Semitic things. Other church leaders have just the history of the church. You just have to study it. Um, and we still have the same thing today. Uh, you know, that uh, wanting to see Jews killed and put out of existence. This just happened a few weeks ago when a group of a Palestinian protest in Australia yelled, uh, had a had a little rally called Gas the Jews. They were chanting Gas the Jews. You can look it up. It's on a video um, in Australia by pro-Palestinian mob, Palestinian mob. Of course, we know anti-Semitism is alive on, Jew on U.S. campuses. Past few weeks have been really bad. Um, where my community, where I grew up, Somebody was going to certain doors that had an Israeli flag and knocking on the door and calling them Zionist pigs. That's the community I grew up in, which was a Jewish community or is a Jewish community. That's been going on all across different places. Um, perhaps we might ask ourselves, will the nation of Israel ever go out of existence? I don't think so. Jeremiah 31, 35 to 37, right after the new covenants talked about, he says, Thus the Lord who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, he stirs up the sea so that its waves war. The Lord of hosts is his name, and this fixed order departs from before me, declares the word. Then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, the heavens above can be measured, and the foundation of the earth below can be explored. Then I will cast off all the offspring of Israel for all they've done decrees, declares the Lord. Okay. I don't think God is saying there that anything that the nation of Israel will ever go out of existence. If you read that script, those scriptures carefully. Okay. Now, just a few things about Hamas. If you read the Hamas charter, you can read it online. It's not hidden. Um, they even have a new updated one. Um, it's very anti, a lot of anti-Semitism um, there, of course. They blame the Jews for um, French and communist revolutions, World War I, World War II. Um, the charter directs the killing of the Jews, drawing from a Hadith saying those are the sayings of Muhammad. They think those the Hadith are sayings of Muhammad, um, written well after Muhammad. But... There's a lot of passages in the Quran that talks about the Jews. I can't go over all of them, a lot of negative things about the Jews. Um, this Hadith saying says the day of judgment will not come until the Muslims fight the Jews and kill them. Then the Jews will hide behind rocks and trees, and the rocks and trees will cry out, Oh, Muslim, there's a Jew behind him, behind me, come and kill him. Um, but like it, uh, any other religion, in Islam you have really conservative Orthodox Muslims, of course, you have moderates and liberals, and you have secular and nominal Muslims. <clears throat> so I don't want to try to paint everybody in the same camp. It just depends on who you deal with. There's even a book called The Jew is Not My Enemy, and unveiling the myths of fuel of Muslim anti-Semitism. This guy's more of a liberal Muslim. He says that, you know, this whole thing's ridiculous, and he supports the Jews. There was an article that came out in 2004 about a San Diego State professor. Remember, academics are, you know, a little more, um, I think they're a little more moderate about these issues, but he actually said in this interview, he stated the Quran supports the fact that Israel belongs to the Jews. You know, he translates a certain portion of the Quran and basically he said the land first belonged to the Jews. It doesn't matter if the Jews are exiled 500, 2000 years later. The land belongs to Moses' people, the Jews. So that's a more academic and liberal or moderate view. Of course, he ticked off a lot of Muslims when he said this. Kind of interesting. Um, so, you know, the bottom line is that uh, when Paul says this in Romans 9, which I mentioned, for I wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel, talks about the adoption of the covenants, receiving the law, the temple worship, and the promises. There's are the patriarchs from them as trace the human ancestry of Christ. Uh, the truth of the matter is, is that <clears throat> the people who hate the Jews hate God. Okay, it's just a bottom line issue. They're made in the image of God, just like everybody else. Of course, if you hate any people group, you really hate God. But those who really 
are anti-Semitic, um, just hate God. Okay, they're uh, his elect people. Um, we know that through them we have the Word of God. We know that through them we have the Messiah that came into the world. Um, Messiah came in Jewish flesh. He was 100% Jewish. He was not Palestinian, by the way, as some Palestinians say. He came in the land of Israel, fulfilling Old Testament prophecies, and he will return the land of Israel. He's is if he's not Israel's Messiah, he's not the Messiah for anybody. Okay, he's he's Israel's Messiah for the sake of the whole world. The whole world benefits from that. Of course, the ultimate cause of anti-Semitism comes from the father of lies, Satan himself, who loves to just poison the minds of men with his hatred of the Jews. We know that it starts with a demonic source. I think everybody probably knows that. But let me say uh, one last thing here. Part of this issue, um, this whole issue about Israel being the oppressor and the Palestinians the oppressed group, part of this goes back to critical race theory, which is being taught on all college campuses now. Critical race theory came into uh, view or came into, uh, started being discussed a lot more the last three or four years. and. <clears throat> it basically is a thing that deals with issues of injustice, racism, inequality, right? And wants to reshape society. Um, it is generally closely aligned with things such as communism, Marxism, progressivism, intersexuality, and a very non-biblical view of social justice. But if you look at number four here, critical race theory really teaches there's two groups, the oppressed and the oppressor. OK, there's oh, they see things in these two categories. If you have transgender groups, they're the oppressed. The oppre there's someone that's oppressing them. If you have the gay community, they're the oppressed. There's someone that there's a group that's oppressing them. Um, you have the African-American community. They're being oppressed and there's an oppressor. Right. Um, there's always or vice versa, whatever. The, it can go on and on all kinds of examples. But in the case of Israel, um, Israel is viewed as the oppressor, and of course the Palestinians are the oppressed, right? <clears throat> Israel is living in occupied territory, as they say, which assumes that Palestinian, you know, the Palestinians, it was, it was, you know, it's all theirs anyway. Israel doesn't deserve any homeland, okay? Um, critical race theory is not biblical. Um, there's no forgiveness. There's no resolution. All it is, does basically is wants more and more and more atonement and wants more and more, um, asks for more and more and more, but there's any, never any resolution because they just, all they do is condemn and constantly um, penalize people. Um, and so really there's not a whole lot that's biblically good about critical race theory. Great book that came out by my friend Neil Shedney, uh, Shenvey about a month ago, Critical Dilemma, The Rise of Critical Theories and Social Justice Ideology. You can get that book if you want to read more about that. And then finally, remember the strongholds thing, as I said, I talked about this a couple months ago, pulling down strongholds. So Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians 10. We are fighting a spiritual battle. Paul talks about, of course, the context of this passage I talked about. People were doubting his apostleship. There was a lot of false apostles at his time, but he talks about tearing down arguments and every obstacle is raised up against the knowledge of God, taking every thought captive to obey Christ. You know, this is a form of spiritual warfare. These strongholds are thought patterns, um, strongholds in thinking, you know, mindsets, reasoning, speculations. They're false philosophies, ideologies, and they're in people's minds, right? And they're definitely in the minds of this debate over Israel and the Palestinians, okay? And <clears throat> we need to be praying that God pulls down these strongholds, okay? He, we need to be praying that people like this back here that simply have signs that Israel, need, you know, gassing the Jews or Israel needs to be put out of existence, whatever it is, these are strongholds in these people's thinking. I just ran into this today. I'll give you an example doing outreach at Columbus State Community College, one of our campuses. And I ran into a, a student who has one family member living in the West Bank and he and another member is living in Jordan. So I asked him, we started talking about the situation there. 
he said Hamas is a separate group from the Palestinians. He didn't agree with everything Hamas, but then I started talking about what Hamas had done to the Jewish people there, what, you know, of course, happened over the last three weeks. He didn't even believe it ever happened. He said, the evidence I've seen is that the Hamas didn't really do that. If anything, he said, Jews have been committing genocide against Palestinian babies and killing Palestinian babies, and Jews have been committing genocide against Palestinians, going and killing them willingly. He basically would not even agree that what the Hamas did about three weeks ago to those Jewish families ever happened. You know why? Because he's watching Palestinian media, he's reading, and he, then he went on to say, it's our land anyway, said the Jews should be out of there. So once again, I can't reason with someone like this. I can, I share the gospel with them, of course. But the point is that there are strongholds in thinking here. These are strongholds, okay? False thoughts, beliefs, and arguments that they're taking in all day long, and we're in a spiritual battle, okay? And all we can do is keep praying our brains out that these strongholds are removed, okay? We know where they come from. Now, I'm not saying that there can't be any strongholds in Jewish people either, or strong, their strongholds are everywhere. I'm just saying that when I talk to someone like that today and they don't even believe that Hamas did that, they don't even think that ever happened. That's pretty bad. Okay. All right. So that's all I have to say. And that was a lot. There's a lot more I could cover, but hopefully that's a good starting point. Okay. So I'll go ahead and stop recording.